Right then, everybody. Um, good afternoon. It is one o'clock on Thursday, and hello and welcome to this live demo for September 2020. Uh, we've got lots of people coming on today, um, a few more people just arriving, so um, I won't stall any longer. Um, special welcome to those of you who joined us on Wednesday for our PrivSec webinar. Uh, with the Data Protection World Forum. Actually, that was Tuesday, uh, and it's great to see you again. Hello also, of course, to those of you who are returning who come along to many of our events. I can see some familiar names in there as well, so welcome to you too. Unlike our webinars, this live demo is an opportunity for anyone interested in our data discovery tech to see it in action. This month, we're talking about automating data privacy and regulation with data discovery. And we're gonna be answering the question, how can your organization automate its GDPR compliance program? By way of introduction, for those who are new to our events, I'm your host, James McCarthy, the CMO at Ixonar, and I am joined by Tom, um, who, for those who are returning, know I crown our demo king every month, much to his amusement. Uh, this time he's been treated to a blue crown, apparently. Um, Tom is from our customer success team, spends every week with customers, helping them to get the best out of our technology. Um, Tom, I know you weren't feeling great yesterday, so thanks for showing up today. It's much appreciated. Um, the show must go on, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Good to be here. All right. Thanks, Tom. Right. So um, we're going to get straight into it. Um, today's agenda is very, very simple. Uh, we're in the quick intro at the moment. I'm going to introduce um, a fictitious company for the purposes of today's demo. Um, we're going to talk about data policies. Um, we're going to very briefly talk about how Exonar Reveal, our data discovery product, works. Um, and then we're going to go straight into demoing three scenarios. So I'm not going to hang about. Uh, we want to get you into the good stuff, which is um, that you can see things happening. So um, this is what we're going to look like uh, as we go into the demo. So please don't be shy, interact with the session, um, ask a question, seek clarification. Uh, there's a Q&A button towards the bottom of your screen. Um, please use that to ask questions as we go. Or indeed, if you've arrived with questions, please put them in there now. We will do our best to cover those at the end during Q&A. So I'd like to introduce our fictitious private healthcare customer today, uh, Example Health, apparently protecting families since 1963. Uh, proud organization, two and a half thousand employees. Uh, they're based in the UK and I've made them UK based for GDPR reasons. So they come under the GDPR um, regulations. Um, let's say that they've got 1500 medical practitioners um, for UK based private patients who are therefore consumers. And um, they are, as an organization, GDPR compliant in terms of policy, but they're looking to automate that governance into the future. Uh, those of you on the, um, the webinar a couple of days ago um, heard us talking about that and how data discovery fits in. So this is how you see where that happens. Um, the point about Example Health is that they have three different systems containing sensitive uh, personal data. Um, I've named them Alpha, Gamma and Amiga. So Alpha is the finance system. It has credit card details in it. It has financial information for all of the private clients. Gamma is a CRM system. It has all of the PII in terms of communications and manages all of the communications with the client base. And then Omega is a medical record system that contains details of consultations and all the medical um, information that goes with it. So all three areas containing sensitive information. And of course, that kind of data is what we refer to as structured data. So it's very organized, relatively speaking. Um, you'll find sensitive information pretty well ordered in that environment. And of course, we can um, look into that data with our data discovery capability too. The other thing that's happening in example health is there's the normal amounts of unstructured data that you would find in any organization. So the emails, the documents, et cetera, um, that go around and, and employees are using to get their jobs done, to share information, et cetera. Um, there'd also be chat, uh, things like Microsoft Teams or Slack or other um, communication technologies in there that are uh, holding all sorts of unstructured data um, as employees work together and work to serve their patients. And of course, that will all be stored in other data sources and storage as well. So what I'm hoping is Example Health kind of represents a typical kind of medium to large type organization in healthcare. 
So what we're going to be looking at is how Example Health then look at their data policies. Um, and data policies um, will be numerous, no doubt. All organizations have lots of them under GDPR and other policies as well for other regulation. And really, it's all about the what, where and when of personal data. So what's the specific characteristics of the data within your policy? Which data are you talking about? Um, where should it be stored? Where could it and, and rightly should, should it be located uh, within the data estate? And then when should that retention of that data um, be considered to be complete? So how long should you keep the data for? And what then happens to the data um, after that? And is it being disposed of uh, to prevent over retention? Um, and of course, Example Healthcare has a whole load of GDPR policies they wrote back in 2018 or earlier. Um, we're going to look at three today, and they're very simple, and they're, they're simplified for the purposes of the demo. Policy number one is going to be about customer bank account details and the fact they shouldn't be stored, written, or shared outside of Alpha, the finance system. They shouldn't be on paper in emails or messaging apps. They should only exist in that structured information where they can be controlled and protected. Um, the second policy is going to say that no personally identifiable information relating to customers should be copied stored or shared outside of the gamma CRM system on paper in emails or messaging apps. So same thing, all of that PII should stay in its structured form where it can easily be protected. Access to that information can be controlled and obviously it prevents it being proliferated around the business. The third one is gonna be around patient medical information. So as a healthcare organization, um, that information should not be kept outside of the Amiga system for more than three months following a consultation and patient medical details should not be retained for longer than three years after the last consultation. Now, of course, um, if anyone is dialing in from a healthcare company, they may or may not relate directly to your policies, but you kind of get the point of what we're trying to do. So we're gonna come back to these three policies, P1, P2, P3, in just a minute. First of all, I'm gonna talk very briefly about what data discovery is and what Ixonar reveal our product does. And effectively, we're all about discovering all of the data that organizations have both in structured form and unstructured form in all sorts of data storage area, data sources across the data estate at huge scale. And when we talk about scale, we're talking about billions of data items that we are able to index. And that representation on the screen there is a representation of how the index works. It's very similar to what you might find Google does for the internet. So Google goes and crawls and indexes websites and all, makes all of that information available in an instantly searchable form. We do a very, very similar thing internally for your data estate. Um, and then we put that information at the fingertips of various employees. And we'll talk about that in a second. I'm not gonna go through this um, uh, overview in much detail, but we start at the bottom. We connect to all of those data sources. We ingest all of the data, uh, whether it be in structured or unstructured form. We then store it and we enrich that information. So we understand using a combination of techniques, what kind of sensitive information is in there, the PII, we understand topics um, from text. So we extract the context of documentation and we go down to the, the content level as well within that information. And when you see it, Tom will be showing you the, the content within the files as well and how we identify those bits of information. And that's what we um, place in our index in a searchable form. And then the fifth piece there is around refreshing it. So the index is only any good if you keep it up to date. Again, just like Google, when it crawls the internet, it refreshes that on a continual basis. So the search results will change as the data in your estate changes. And then we make that available to very specific individuals or groups within the organization. So this is not an enterprise search tool where every employee can search for very, very sensitive information. It's designed for a small number of specialist employees to find the information they need, either to be able to protect it or to be able to drive value from that data. So that's one thing that we make sure that people don't, um, don't misunderstand. We're not providing a search bar interface into everything your organization has. We're giving appropriate access to specialist individuals. And on the left-hand side here, data governance staff looking for data outside of policy is exactly what we're talking about today. Okay, so back to the demo. Um, we're gonna cover policy one, policy two, and policy three in order. 
And so um, just before we do that, I'm going to remind you to use the Q&A. Um, please don't be shy. Uh, and we already have a, Q and a question in there as well, which is great. Uh, how do you keep data fresh and up to date? I'll come back to that later if that's okay, and we will crack on just now. So scenario one is um, this policy here. Customer bank account details should not be stored, written, or shared outside of the secured system. Now, um, Tom, if you want to get ready to pull um, to pull my screen, you can then show how we're going to go about finding these cu customer bank account details um, and other similar financial information. Absolutely. Let me just uh, take control, load up the right screen. Okay, so a lot of you might not recognize this. Uh, I just want to bring attention to the new home screen of Exona. Um, it, beforehand, it just showed off a couple of dashboards straight away. Um, but here we just see a breakdown of the system from my user's perspective. So it kind of just shows you find in terms of the searches that we do, visualization in terms of the dashboards that we have, and then automation, which is essentially how we turn those searches into something that runs on a regular basis or a schedule. Um, so what I'm going to do just to show the bank account examples is head straight to our advanced search. Um, again, you might recognize this uh, if you've been here before. And so what I'm going to do is let's load up um, some of our example searches that are at the box. Uh, so you see a few here like health information, employee data, CV files, etc. Um, these are very much a template and a great place to start. And so in terms of the bank account details, I'm just going to load up one that we already have. And so now what you're seeing is the query, the combination of uh, search uh, criteria that we're putting into the uh, search. And in this case, it's just looking for bank account details. But as an extension to what James uh, just mentioned, we will focus it on a specific data set or an area of our system. Um, but it's important to note that what I see in the system is what I explicitly have been given access to. So I can just run the search from that perspective too. So let me just run the search as is. Now what we get here is fifth, uh, about 14,000 uh, files or uh, emails or so on uh, of items that have returned. And so we can actually have a look at the, what, the examples in this list. So if I click on the first one, just as a place to start, now you see a breakdown of our, it's essentially the document inspection window. And so you see the actual body of the, fi the, the file, or in this case, an email. Uh, you see the to and the from fields here. We've extracted some topics. And then on the right hand side, we have our search hits feature, which is again, just shows a breakdown of where we've matched in that file. So there are no hits in the metadata. However, as you can see in the body or well, the content of that document, we have a lot and you can go straight to it and you can see the context around it. So we can see that it's not just account number. We've actually got uh, all the account number as a word or phrase. Uh, it's the account number as well. Um, and so we can tab through the examples and we can see the results. But what we're interested in here is actually seeing where the data is. So let me just show that. So let's say I work in a business or I don't want to find anything in the business services or actually that's my only focus uh, on cleaning up the data. We can modify our query and build that in. And so if I drag over data set here, let me just scroll down slightly, drag that data set here. Now we can focus our efforts on, on business, uh, business services. So I'll click on that, rerun the search. Now I'm just focused on that area that maybe I want to tidy up. So if I just remove that and again, you can see the list of files. So what I can do is I can turn this straight into a workflow and start to automate this. So I'm going to quickly show you how we do that. Uh, so I can give it a name. So in this case, I'll go bank account. Uh, if I can spell bank account details, uh, I already have one, so I'm going to go bank account details too. But you can obviously provide a relevant description too. Uh, hit next here. And then this is where the automation comes in essentially. So I can schedule it to be daily weekly, monthly, or quarterly. So in this case, I'm going to do daily. We can also perform an action. So we can apply tags, which are within the Exonar platform to that document, a tag of our choice. Uh, you can customize the name. 
And then finally, you can notify other users. So you can uh, notify within the platform, you can send emails, but more importantly, you can share that with other platform users. So if I tick that box and hit find users, what you see now is the people that I can share that workflow with. So if I actually instead close that, don't want to share it with anyone in this case, it's just myself, I can hit next and then I can create that workflow. And then in the uh, next two examples, I'll show you exactly the power of that. So yeah, back over to you, James. Okay, great. Let me grab the screen back. So um, thank you for that, Tom. Um, we're now going to take a look at the privacy dashboard, which is really useful for working out what types of personal information an organization stores um, for more general communications and where that information is, who the author is. From um, the dashboard that I think you're going to show, Tom, we can work out what types of searches and workflows we might want to run. Um, so let's look to see if we can find those, Tom, if you want to take uh, the screen back again. Okay, fantastic. Just like again. Okay, so now we've gone back to the home screen that I showed before, and this time we're going to focus on our dashboard, so the visualization. So as James says, if we head straight to the privacy dashboard, now we are seeing uh, basically a breakdown of the personal uh, data that Exona has identified. So it's 50 gigs. Uh, in the system, which, uh, you know, fairly manageable, 260,000 files. And what you're seeing here is a breakdown of how much out of our total data set is personal data. So it's, it's, it's more or less 50-50 in this case. Uh, and then we're seeing the different categories of personal data, so sensitive data and versus all other personal data. And then on the right-hand side here, we're seeing a breakdown of the types of personal data that we extract. So we're talking about credit card numbers, email, address, uh, email addresses, and I numbers, postcodes, and so on. Uh, in this system, it seems very much that there's just a lot of people's names, references to ethnicity and email addresses, but you know, it will vary depending on the system and the area that you're focused on or have access to. Uh, and like with all of our dashboards, you can interact with these and you can filter your results accordingly. Um, so if I wanted to focus on that sensitive data, I can click in on there and instead focus it in on those 25 gigabytes and then develop an approach to actioning that. Or equally, I could focus on a particular, you know, particular part of personal data. So say actually, email addresses is a place I want to focus, customer email addresses, for instance, maybe, uh, and so on. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea, so you can get a feel for where the personal data is. Uh, you see a few other um, uh, breakdowns of that data to when it was last modified, which is something to think about. Um, the authors maybe um, in certain departments should be uh, in certain places. We've got breakdown of data set, which is essentially how we break down our uh, data estate and give them uh, references or labels. In this case, it's departmental. And then we see a breakdown of topics. But yeah, that kind of gives you an idea. But what I'm going to do here is actually show you an example of how we might focus in on a particular bit of PII and then automate that. So if I show you here, um, I can actually head straight into our workflow example that I made earlier. So if I go to emails with PII, so this is just a list of my workflows, just so you understand the screen that you're looking at. Um, list of workflows in the system and the ones that I have access to. I'm going to focus in on this example, which is essentially uh, any emails that contain PII and are not in the business services data set. Um, so it's almost like the opposite example to what I showed in terms of where we're looking. And so now you see the workflow window. Uh, what, uh, so you have the description. Uh, you have the list of the items found, so we can uh, take a look at that. And then on the right-hand side here, you see the workflow history, which, as you can see in this case, goes down, up and down, depending on how many items that it is detecting. And so you see the total items found. You see any new items that are in the, found in the system uh, from, uh, you know, as a zone are ingest the data and we ingest and so on. Um, and so what we're seeing here. It's just that curve as we are actioning those files, we can see the workflow uh, run, rerunning, and then we can focus in on reducing that number. But it, as, as an overall, what we're looking at is 
uh, any most attaining PII. So those are those categories that I've showed in the privacy dashboard. And so what we see is a breakdown here of 144 emails that match that criteria. Um, so to go to the, the policy then, P2, um, yeah. what you've kind of shown is kind of an investig investigative, that's difficult to say, approach um, where you've gone and f figured out where all the PII is and where, where it's located. Mm -hmm. If you then wanted to bring that back into specific queries that relate yeah. to policy P2, yeah. you'd be able to refine that query to the point where actually it's only showing you the things that you want it to show you. And then from a monitoring point of view, every time this workflow runs, which is effectively a rerun of the search, you can see how you're tracking in terms of monitoring policy. Exactly. And so what I could do here, in this case, edit query, just to show that off, I'm searching for personal information. And so I could focus in on the data set, which is where it's stored, or, I, or we could focus in on the age of that document. So when was that? file last modified and we can add that to our search term and that will be reflected in the results as well. And you've looked at email here, but it could be messaging apps, messaging threads. It could be all sorts of media that you'd be looking at. It could be in documentation of other sorts as well, depending on what makes sense for your organization. Yeah, that's exactly. really, really good. Um, are we ready to move on? Uh, yes. All right. So let's go and have a look at P3 then. So the third policy um, was all about um, uh, not bank account details, oddly enough. Uh, P3 was all about medical details. So apologies there, we've got the wrong thing on the wrong screen. Uh, P3 was all about finding med medical details or where medical information should be stored and how long it should be retained for. Um, so uh, if I just go back here, I'm just gonna go and have a look at this again, just to make sure that we're clear. It's all about patient medical information shouldn't be kept outside the Omega system for more than three months. Patient medical details should not be retained for longer than three years after the last consultation. So Tom, could you show us um, some medical information and, and how you would do that same process for that type of data? Uh, yes, exactly. I will do that. So just switch over to my screen. So this is a workflow that I made earlier and Again, you'll recognize the breakdown is the same, similar, same as before. Uh, so, so yeah, medical condition workflow. But what I'm actually doing here is I'm searching for, uh, there's a list of about, I believe it's about a thousand medical conditions in this example. And we're trying to focus in on if there's not only just a medical condition, but also a reference, you know, like a person's name or an email address on top of that. Because if there's a list of medical conditions, it's not that useful to us, but if it's medical condition and an association with an actual person, then it becomes sensitive information. And so then we're focusing in on getting any policies and templates out of that search too. So that's what the search is doing. And what I can show you here, again, it's the total new items and uh, any new items that are found. And I can see the list at the bottom here of those files. So if I just click on when the search initially ran, give a bit of time for it to load and process. Here we see the initial list of say 5,000 in this case. And so actually I went to show you one of the examples here and we can actually take a look at that again and inspect it like I showed before. In this case, we can see it's a patent document and that it has um, references to medical conditions. And so as we tab through, we can see on the right hand side here what it's matched against. Um, and, and so yeah, that's one example that we found in the system. But really when we're looking for high concentrations of personal data, which is where I start, try and start with a lot of our customers, kind of highlight areas to really focus on because you have high risk items more email, uh, more personal information and it's a higher risk if it got out or anything like that so if i go back to our window here i find that commonly those sorts of files are found uh, those sorts of uh, files are found in spreadsheets um, and so if i click on spreadsheets as a category we now see a, a, a list of the 263 spreadsheets that contain medical conditions and so Straight away, you can see a couple of uh, potentially interesting files. We can see uh, incidents uh, report. So let's take a look at that as an example. Um, and so 
now you're seeing again, like before, the actual content of that spreadsheet and where we've matched within that file. And so let's have a look at the file itself and see what we've picked in on. So we see a couple of matches here with our search highlighting, which shows exactly where uh, the, the, the search is matched. And so we see a breakdown of the references to medical conditions, but now we're actually coming to a, a, a you know, much more interesting section of the document. We can see a breakdown of a pers the person's name, even their address it looks like, uh, uh, not a, a date as well. Um, probably not a date of birth, it's 2008, but you never know, uh, Dale, uh, Dale Stern and so on. So you can really see here the power of the platform. We've searched for, just to reiterate, we've searched for a thousand medical conditions and references to people's names. And so as we scroll down here, we can immediately identify that this is something actually we might want to move into the proper location. So I'm focusing in on this business services data set at the moment, but that might not be the right place. And so we can now actually tab through to the next example. Let's just show that off. Uh -huh. uh, actually, there's a there's a question on that, Tom. Uh, oh, I'm just okay. conscious of time. Um, yeah, that's fine. So there's a question here. Does the tool also map the data to the business or department that holds or processes the data? So I think that's exactly your point there. Uh, does it also allow the data flow between the departments or offices in a company? So um, I think one of the views you could show is is the data source that it comes from, the data set that it comes from and our customers are able to name the data sets. So it could be different departments or functions within the organization. And your policy, of course, um, may allow or may enable for information to be shared across certain boundaries and across certain data sets, but not others. Um, so I think that's a, a definite yes. Um, with our customers, we map the data sets. And then, of course, you can define your searches by data set and then see how that data is then transferring between them. Yeah, so actually, just to add to that very quickly, I know we don't have long, I'll go straight to the actual medical search again and run that. And what I can do is show off those data sets that James just described. So if I hit um, viewer visualization and data set, now what we see here are essentially those systems, those, 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 those system mappings. And so we see a lot in the government data set, acne, defense, and so on. So that just kind of further explains that example. And another really good question actually that, that's sort of related, I'll pick up from Martin White here. So um, email and PII demonstration when we were, were doing that in the last bit, yeah. the dashboard showed the source as file share. Um, and of course, yes, um, you're absolutely right, Martin, we're not actually using example health data. Um, so the scenario that Tom's looking at was PII and indeed, of course, um, you probably wouldn't be looking for email data in file share unless it's stored in PST files, uh, which commonly happens within customers. And we often find email information um, stored in file shares for that reason, not because yeah. they're in an inbox in exchange. Yeah, so in, in, in this example, um, they are, I am searching for the file type and it has the email file type, so any uh, email file types that we have in the file shares is that is that's the information that's bringing up and that's mainly just due to the data sources that we're connected to in this case uh, yeah. but it's the same concept for uh, calling an email and doing that exactly that right um so um i was going to suggest we um we come back here and there's a final question um from Neharika, which is how do you keep your data fresh and up to date? And I don't know whether you asked that before um, I went through this slide or not, um, but effectively the stage five here is the refresh of data. Um, and essentially uh, we go back and re-ingest data based on um, whether we think it's likely to change. So just like Google does, it doesn't go and suck up everything again. It goes to the areas where it knows that uh, the data is less often at rest. Um, and hotter data or warmer data, and it goes and does that as well. So we have ways in which we choose to ingest depending on the data set we're trying to look at, depending on whether we think it's data at rest that's been there for a while or whether we think it's up to date, or indeed some of our projects and programs are for things like data migrations and they're one-off crawls. So we don't in fact keep it up to date. We do it for a one-off audit uh, and don't then update it thereafter. So it very much depends um, on the type of data we're looking for, what the customer's trying to achieve with that data. Um, would you add, add anything to that, Tom? 
now on you. Uh, no, uh, no, essentially, that's uh, that, that. I think that's what it boils down to. Um, our system can uh, continuously crawl certain systems, and so we do detect if there are any file, if any files have changed, or any new files have come in, or any new files have gone, and so that reflects in the system after uh, the amount of time it takes to uh, go th go th go through it. Um, and then, in terms of workflows, uh, you can also do a similar thing right so you can run it on a schedule and you can keep the workflow and the list of files in that workflow up to date too indeed okay tom uh, we would normally go to q a but i think we've tried to hit those questions and answers within uh within that uh dialogue there so um thank you very much for those three questions much appreciated um we're now going to move on and wrap up the session thank you very much tom for yet another great demo um, we covered an awful lot of ground there, including introducing a fictitious company and trying to sort of set the context. So thanks for bearing with us. We hope you found that really, really useful. If you're ready for more information, we've got lots of resources on our website. Uh, there's a particular guide here. If you've come off the webinar on Tuesday and now you're thinking about, okay, how do I take this further? We've picked out one of our guides here in our resources section which is how to discover and manage all your personal data. We felt that fitted with this particular session. You can download it down at the bottom there, that link, exo.nr slash manage will take you to the page and you can get hold of that report. Um, otherwise, um, that's time for us to wrap up. You will find a lot of other resources as well at exonar.com slash resources. We are quite prevalent on LinkedIn. Please follow us in there. We also tweet. Um, so please find us in Twitter as well. The next live demo is extracting hidden data assets um, and that's going to be on October the 20th, 2020. So that's going to be another 30 minute um, event and we hope to find you there. Um, essentially that is it. Um, thank you very much for coming along and uh, we look forward to seeing you again in future. Take care. <laughs>